For a moment, I wanted to comment. Someone, um, a visitor this morning said, oh, we came this morning because we heard you were preaching on Revelation, it says Titus. And they said, what happened? And I said, oh, here, let me show you something. I'll show you what I showed them. The book of Revelation is 22 chapters long. It's in separate parts. Chapter one is the revelation of Christ, two and three to the church. And where we've proceeded in our walk through Revelation is four and five is all about, as you see on the screen, the throne room of the universe, which is made up of two elements, worship, and, and that's what we're doing, and redemption, which is the content of what we're worshiping God for. And so we have proceeded through Revelation 4 and 5 far enough to get to that redemption component. And what we're looking at is how God describes redemption. So we, for those of you that are worried, we haven't left Revelation. We're looking at redemption from one of the words that's used in the scripture. So I wanted you to know that. So I just wanted to let you know. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Titus. And what we're looking at is what I've entitled the redemption-driven life. And that's based on the fact we started in heaven. And we started in heaven looking at the elements of worship, and we got to that element that the, the theme, the content of the worship of, of the saints of heaven is redemption. Redemption is the theme of all of that, that worship that we're offered. And so as we began investigating the one English word, redeem or redemption, this, this one word in its two forms, is actually produced by three completely different Greek words. So God describes redemption in three completely different ways. They're all centered around the act of redemption, but from three beautiful different vantage points. So that's what we're looking at, and that's how we got there. And as we open our Bibles to Titus 2, God has declared that each of us have been forever set free. See, the idea of redemption that we're looking at this morning, the third word that's in Titus 2.14, is that we were set free forever from the bondage to sin. Now you say, you know, I mean, that might not knock you over to think about it, but some people, whenever they think about being saved, they just get overwhelmed at the reality of what they were. I'll always remember when Bonnie and I started out uh, on the East Coast, we actually started out on the West Coast, but when we moved to pastor in uh, New England, I had no idea what I was getting into, and it was an old 200 or 175-year-old church, and everybody for generations had sat in the same pew, and I mean, I didn't know any about that. Him, because but, uh, we're redeemed, we saw that last week, we're supposed to glorify God. It's supposed to be our motivation, but redemption is also what fills our hearts and pours out when we are talking about our lives on earth in heaven. We're saying, thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for being a great redeemer. Thank you for your blood poured out to set us free forever from the power of sin. You see, what we have in the gospel, we, are, we aren't even aware we get impressed by jet fighters and hydrogen bombs and, and power, you know, and military. We don't realize we have something that is unbelievably powerful. We have the antidote to slavery to sin. We can see people set free by the power of God, and that's what redemption is about. And that's why we're taking so long looking at it. Well, that gets us to this concept. As we open to Titus 2, and I'm going to read verses 11 through 14, we see that redemption was not merely that we were bought at the slave market of sin. Two weeks ago, we saw that. Last week, we saw we were bought out of the slave market of sin. But this morning in Titus 2, 14, we see that we were bought forever from the slavery of sin. And that's what this passage is about, we are de redeemed forever from every lawless deed. Well, with that in mind, Titus 2, 11 to 14, let's stand together. Let's listen to God explain to us the wonders of redemption through the Apostle Paul. Titus 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Wow. We're redeemed from every lawless deed and 
purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Wow. Redemption. The purpose we have to live. Special people, zealous for what God wants. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, thank you for this glorious statement of our redemption. A different facet, but united in the truth that you are the redeemer. We are the redeemed by faith in Christ's sacrifice and that you redeemed us so that we would be your own very special people. That we would be liberated forever from the slavery and chains and prison house of sin. And that we would become more and more each day zealous for good works. Teach us about that from your word, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Think of the context of what we're reading in Titus 2, because I, I've said this often, but I'll tell you again, the Bible is like one massive woven tapestry. We're over here in this little part of Titus 2, verses 11 to 14, but if we jiggle this, it just ripples the whole fabric because it's all connected. Think of when Paul was writing this. Paul was writing to Titus about 62 AD. Paul was in the Roman imprisonment. Most Bible scholars, you read your study Bible, will say that. Paul was there as a guest of the most public homosexual of all, Nero. And Paul was a prisoner in Nero's special prison for royal prisoners or empire special prisoners. And as he was there under house arrest, as he was awaiting his trial, he's writing to Titus. What he wrote to Titus, he didn't just grab out of thin air. It was just a restatement of the foundational truths that Paul had taught for about oh, 11 years or so, or 12, and then had written down in his greatest epistle. If you took all of Paul's epistles, the one that would stand tallest is the epistle to the Romans, to the very city where he was a prisoner. And Paul had already declared Christian doctrine, especially the doctrine of salvation, which is most surrounding redemption. Redemption has many pieces. The justification piece, the sanctification piece, the adoption piece, the forgiveness piece. But redemption, we sing not about justification in heaven, not about sanctification in heaven. We don't sing about adoption in heaven. We sing about redemption. And Paul has explained all that. And so in about 56 AD, Paul writes Romans, and then he goes on through his ministry. He's captured, taken prisoner, he's in Rome. And now in 62, he is writing to Titus with this, rev this whole revelation of, of the doctrine of redemption already written down in Romans in the background. So I don't want you to think of Titus 2 as just hanging out there that it's something novel. It's connected, and we'll see in a moment very deeply. But for almost six years, the truths of the doctrine of redemption explained in the book of Romans have been circulating. Uh, what they had done is Paul had written from his ministry in Corinth to the church in Rome. The Roman church had, the house churches had copied and distributed that letter around Rome. Then people thought it was so wonderful, they started sending it out, and the epistle to the Romans had just basically begun to circulate all the way across the Roman Empire. And now Paul is writing to a missionary church planner. That's what Titus was. He's on the front lines. And, and at that moment, the scope of the powerful gospel message that had started years back in Judea. Remember, Jesus started one by one setting people free from their bondage to sin. And people were liberated, forgiven, born again, and, and, and just so excited about salvation. What had started in Judea had radiated out and, and by the time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it had just filled the land from north to south, and there were 500 at least believers who were enthusiastically taking the gospel. So Jesus leaves 12, and he tells them, go, and he tells them where? To Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so the gospel permeates Jerusalem, goes out to Judea. By the time we get to chapter 8 of Acts, it's in Samaria. By the time we get to chapter 10, it's going to the... Gentiles in the uttermost parts of the earth. But something becomes noticeable in the gospel presentation. You have to understand the gospel started out being preached by Jesus Christ in Israel. For 1,500 years, the Bible had been in the background of everything Israel did. They might have denied it. They might have disobeyed it. They might have 
followed other gods, but their whole calendar was built into the Bible. Their whole culture, every holiday, every festival, even their names were all tied to God through the Bible, through the Old Testament. But as the gospel started radiating outward from Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, multitudes of pagans were getting saved. Now, a pagan is someone who for generations has been, has been enslaved. And so what they were being told is multitudes were saved, that each person had to be taught that the gospel unleashed them from sin's chains. Now, sin's chains are very powerful, and, and it appeared even more powerful when they started working with pagans. But the message of the gospel is that the, it's, it's not just life insurance. It's not just fire insurance. That's a very small fine print in the bottom. The gospel is primary, primarily a liberation from the enslavement to sin. Now, all of us are enslaved to various sins. There are respectable sins, and there are sins that society frowns upon. But all of us are enslaved to forms of sin. And the redemption message of the gospel is that we are unleashed from sin's chains. The gospel was at work. It was unleashing men and women from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. But many of those getting saved were pagans for generations. And their lives were so deeply soiled with vile and heinous activity that they started wondering, like Titus going to Crete, I mean, are we supposed to do the same thing here, Paul? And you know what Paul said? The message of the gospel that went to the Jews with their background of Christian, or of, the, of the word of God and the gospel that went to the Samaritans who were half Jews and half Gentiles is the very same gospel that goes to the pagans. And the message for all three is redemption. And that's why we're taking so long in this. This is what we're sharing with the world, that we have redemption, that we have been set free from the enslavement of sin. Well, Paul had already written down the doctrine of salvation in the book of Romans. And Titus was going to use that to train an entire generation of believers. And always remember, redemption-driven life works no matter who it's presented to. Whether it's someone like the Cretans that were totally mixed up and, and their lives were totally deeply stained, or if it was these appearing to be very religious Jews, redemption works. But the question is, how are we to be applying the doctrines of redemption? How, how does this truth of what God did out there on the cross 2,000 years ago, how do we apply that today to our impatience, to our fearfulness, to our anxieties? How about to the most permeated sin in America? Do you know what that is? Greed and covetousness. Almost everybody in America is guilty of greed and covetousness. You know why? We all want more. We want more money. We want a better house. We want newer things. We want nicer. We, we, we demand more stuff. And it's just, it's just, that's why our country is getting bankrupted because how do you stop it? Once you start giving and everybody demanding more, how do you stop it? And, and that, that desire for more can be, we can be liberated from that by the gospel. It, on the inside, what, what's called is contentment. Paul says if you have food and raiment, if you're wearing clothes and have something to eat, be content. Wow. What he's saying is if you're not starving and if you're not freezing to death, you ought to be really thankful. And boy, we're not. I mean, I just read a New York Times piece this morning about a woman that's living in Palm Springs, and she said her life is abysmal. She's living on only $1,300 a month in Palm Springs, and she wants more. And it was a very touching article, but that is quintessential to our culture. We want more. And God says, I want to liberate you. How do we apply that? Well, Paul's epistle to the Romans. And let's turn there. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. And what I want to show you is what the Lord does in the doctrine of redemption. Romans chapter 6. And Paul's epistle to the Romans, began, as we began to see last week, sets forth the great doctrines of the gospel of salvation. Number one, the justifying death of Jesus. And the justifying death of Jesus, if you look at chapter 6 of Romans, he talks about the fact in verse 6, knowing that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with. 
that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The justifying death of Jesus Christ, number one, is what God performed through Christ on the cross. That issues into the sanctifying life of Jesus Christ. And that, if you look at Romans 6 and verse 7, that he who has died has been freed from sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe we should also, verse 8, live with him. That's the sanctifying life of Jesus. God wants to unleash the sanctifying life of Jesus into our lives. Um, this morning in first service, I, I, you know, I think in pictures, and I was thinking about going back to the prison, and I just kept thinking about that as I was, uh, you know, preaching this morning, and all of a sudden I thought, when I was little, I remember there was this guy on the Andy Griffith show that used to let himself into the cell. And, and he would always, and I couldn't remember his name, and the guy right here in the front row, Tim, said, Otis. I thought, there's a good Andy Griffith fan. I couldn't remember his name. But do you remember Otis would always stumble back in and say, Andy, I'm checking myself in, and he'd lock the door behind him? That is what is not to be going on in our Christian lives. We're not to be excusing ourselves to go back into the slavery to sin. Why? Because the sanctifying life of Jesus, God wants to unleash into our lives. He wants there to be measurable growth in the decreasing frequency of us yielding to sin and an increasing frequency of us yielding to his sanctifying life. Thirdly, we saw the adopting love of Jesus is what redemption revealed. Uh, th that was in Galatians, that, that we're redeemed for adoption. And, and he adopted us because he loved us. In fact, found the adopting love of Christ. A father that said, I love you, I want you, I accept you, I, I bought you just for me. He couldn't, that's why he'd sit in the balcony. He couldn't get enough of hearing of God's forgiveness and love and adopting power. And that, that just overwhelmed him. And the adopting love of Jesus is what redemption reveals. Fourthly, the grace prompted forgiveness. Jesus is patiently pouring out his forgiveness on all who are justified, sanctified, adopted, and redeemed. But he doesn't forgive you if you're not justified, sanctified, adopted, and redeemed. See, the, the first step is accepting, receiving, allowing his forgiveness. And then the redeeming cross of Christ, which provides us with salvation and gives us a new redemption-driven purpose to live for the glory of the one who purchased us out of the slave market. See, that's, that's the, the message of the book of Romans and of the gospel. Now, how does all that work? Well, last time we, we ended with looking at, bought, out of the, or bought at the slave market, bought out of the slave market, but now in Titus 2, and, and turn back to verse 14, because I want to show you the word we're going to target on, Titus 2, 14, it says this, he, verse 14, who gave himself for us, that's on the cross, Titus 2.14, Jesus gave himself in our place that he might, and the word redeem in your Bible, if, if you're a Bible marker, if you circle that, write the word lutrao by there, L-U-T-R-A-O, lutrao. And what lutrao means is to set free, to set free by paying a price. Jesus paid the price. What is it at the beginning of verse, verse 14? He gave himself. Jesus himself was the price. But he gave himself, that was the price, to, to set us free. And, and notice what it says in verse 14, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. What that means is there is no sin that any longer has to enslave us. It doesn't matter whether it's as, as heinous and awful as homosexuality or as heinous and awful as being prejudiced or as heinous and awful as being evil speaking of people or of being a gossip or of a liar or being of hypocritical. It doesn't matter if it's covetousness or gluttonousness. It doesn't matter. They're all sins. And there's no sin that can enslave us anymore. You say, but how come Christians still live in sin? Because we're like Otis. We give up and go into the cell and say, I, I give up. But that's not God's plan. And that's not where God wants us to be. That, and it doesn't glorify him. Um, just for a moment, turn onward from Titus to the right. Go by to 1 Peter. So go Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter chapter 1. Because I want to show you the second place in the Bible this word 
uh, lutrao shows up this idea of being set free by the payment of a ransom price. And Peter is using this in 1 Peter 1.18, the very same word when he writes about the precious blood of Jesus. And what he says in verse 18 is, knowing that you were not redeemed, there's the word uh, that we're studying this morning, set free forever. You were not set free forever, lutrao, redeemed with corruptible things. What are corruptible things? Silver and gold from your aimless conversation uh, received from your fathers. What he's saying is we weren't bought with money. We were bought with the life of Jesus Christ. And, and, and his life was given, and that's why he justified us by giving up his life, which is his death, the justifying death. And then he wants to live through us because he purchased us. Well, what's the lesson of redemption from Titus 2 and 1 Peter 1? Redemption means God bought us to make us zealous for good works. Now back up to Titus 2, where we just were, because I want you to see that at the end. We're not just redeemed. Titus 2.14, look what it says. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed that's forever set free. But look at verse 14. And purify for himself his own special people. Here's the ending. Zealous for good works. What's the lesson of this forever set free redemption. We are to be zealous for good works. A true born again person doesn't say, oh, I know I should do something for the Lord. I ought to get around to that. Yeah, someday I'm going to do that. We become completely taken up with how can we fulfill what we were saved for. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we're saved by grace. It says in verse 10 that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. The purpose that we exist, we are not saved by good works, we're saved for good works, not by, for. And you and I were saved not to escape hell, not just so we can go to heaven, but so that we could be characterized by those who are doing Christ-like goodness in this world. Do you remember Jesus fed people that didn't even like him? Jesus healed people that, that a lot of them, as far as we know, didn't even follow him. They just said, wow. In fact, remember he healed the, the 10 lepers and only the, the Samaritan came back? Jesus said, where are all the rest? See, Jesus was kind to people that didn't care about him. Jesus was, was healing people that didn't even follow him. And we're supposed to have that same kind of love. I just had a conversation with someone um, they, they wanted to have a little meeting about the struggle they had with some Christians they didn't like. And I said, I didn't know. They just said they wanted to talk about it. And I said, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, I don't, I don't like these people. I said, well, are they saved or unsaved? And they said, they're Christians. I said, oh, good. The Bible says you're supposed to love your enemies. And they went, oh, good. You know, because they don't like these people anyway. Because they're... And, and, and they were glad they were saved because they didn't want to have to love them because you're supposed to love your enemies. So I says, oh, they're Christians. So the Bible says love your enemies, but they're not, they're not um, unsaved, lost pagans persecuting you. I said, so they're Christians. Yeah. I said, well, you know what the Bible says? You have to like them. That means emotionally be friends. Did you know it is a sin to not like other Christians. It's actually a sin. We're supposed to have an emotional relationship as part of a family with other believers. Wow. To think about all of the separation in the body of Christ that occurs because because we not only are supposed to love them like we love our enemies, but that love is supposed to go into actually sorrowing with them, feeling with them, and liking them. And that's what Jesus Christ, the good works, he saved us for that. We're supposed to be the kindest, most forgiving, gentle, honest, uh, trustworthy, sacrificial people in the world because we are saved for those good works. Well, redemption means God bought us to make us zealous. And we as believers have been set free by Christ's redemption. The redemption price is the precious blood. And then... The book of Romans tells us, and this is, and I would, I would usually say in conclusion, and I can just see Al getting up out of the, you know what, um, 
I'll have to be careful on that because uh, if I start seeing someone leave, you know, we'll wonder what it is, but we won't do that. Let's turn to the book of Romans. This is where we're going to end this morning, okay? So everybody turn to Romans 6 with me. As you're turning there, I want to talk about the, the, the fact of Romans applying redemption. This is how we're going to apply redemption. The book of Romans helps us apply redemption, and it shows us the choices that redemption prompts. Redemption makes us no longer slaves to sin. We've already seen in verse 7 that we are supposed to make a choice. It says in Romans chapter 6 in verse 7, this beautiful truth, he who has died has been freed from sin. We've been freed from being enslaved to just having to respond in a certain way. When you're bound by sin, if someone hurts you, you hurt them back. If someone isn't nice to you, you resent, smolder, and hold it against them. If someone harms you, then, then you will never forgive them, and you will just get more and more angry at them. That's just the, the responses that are built into lost people. When you're saved, you don't have to respond those ways anymore. The, the connection has been broken. The only way to respond that way is to rebuild the connection. And that's what Romans chapter 6 is all about. What the Lord says is, starting in verse uh, 10, the death that he died, that's the justifying death of Christ, he died to sin once for all, but the life, look at Romans 6.10, the life that he, that's Christ lives, he lives to God. There's the statement of the sanctifying life of Christ at the end and the justifying death of Christ. It's merged into one verse, verse 10. Now, verse 11, and this is where, uh, this is one of the most fascinating passages in the Bible because Romans 6, 11 is, is a transformation of the way that Paul has been communicating. For the first six chapters and ten verses, Paul has been talking only in the indicative verbal form. That means he's just relaying information. He's just saying, you're sinners. You know, Abraham's faith is an example. Christ justified us. Jesus justified us through his death. He's sanctifying us by his life. Now look at verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon. He switches for the very first time in the book of Romans from the indicative to the imperative. What the imperative means is, I expect a response. It's almost like uh, when, you, when you get a, a little note to a graduation open house or a wedding or something like that, and it has four letters at the bottom. Those four French word, uh, respondez-vous si vous plaît. You know, those were five. Responde, si vous play. There's four. RSVP is, is the way in English we say a response is desired. Do you know how God does it in the Bible? Verse 11. He puts it in a different form of Greek. He adds some endings to the verbs that mean, it's kind of like the inflection in your voice where you go, you're coming, aren't you? It, that that is, is not... It's not just a, an idea of, of just talking differently. It's waiting for an answer. It's, it's asking. So the Lord says, are you going to do this? Look at verse 11. He says, I want you, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Redemption-driven living has choices. Here's the first choice. Say yes to God. What that word reckon is, is operate on what you know to be true. I'll always remember when our kids were little, we would drive up to the drive up ATM machine. I'd roll my window down. I'd reach in my pocket. I'd pull out this little tiny thin piece of plastic about this big. Here in Michigan, it's bright orange from PNC. And I stuck it into this hole. And the kids used to just all be, you know, at, over the years, they'd be in their car seats, they'd be always watching what we're doing, and they'd see me take a piece of plastic, put it into a hole in the wall, and all of a sudden, whoop, big wad of money this big would come out. They would say, could we look at your card? And they would want to look at the card, and they'd look at that, and they'd say, how does that work? How, where did you get that? That if you stick it in a hole, money comes out. I mean, it's kind of like, and, and I said, but kiddos, the money came out because I put it in already, you know? And, and they couldn't get that until they got older and finally they understood you have to have something in there to get something out. What does reckon mean? 
The word logizomai is a Greek word that means operate on what you know to be true. I know because of Christ's death, I can resist sin. I've got to operate on that. I know that because of Christ's death, I can resist my besetting sins, the sins that Hebrews 12 says so easily beset me. I can resist my long-term patterns because God has given me the strength to do so. Now that I'm redeemed, I can choose to say yes to God. So the first step of redemption-driven living living is to say, I believe you, God. And, And you walk over and you push on the cell door. And you know what you find? Kind of like Paul after the earthquake in Philippi? They pushed on the cell door and it fell right down. They were liberated. The door would never again close and lock. Now, they could sit there all they wanted, and they did, by the way, so the jailer wouldn't kill himself in Acts 16, but many Christians, they don't ever walk up and push the door. They don't realize that they don't have to be enslaved by their besetting sin. They don't have to be enslaved by their past. Say yes to God. Now look at verse 12. He continues. Redemption, living choice too. Say no to sin. Now that I'm redeemed, I can choose by grace and through faith to say no to my old master and deny my flesh more each day. Therefore, do not let, verse 12 says, sin reign in your mortal body. It's a choice. James put it this way. uh, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God can't be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted, listen to the progression, James 1 says, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. What is he talking about? Lust conceiving? What he's saying is, we have a very few number of seconds to allow that grenade of temptation that's going to inflame our lust. It drops into our lives and the fuse is going, and it's going to blow up and infect us with, with choosing to sin. And so what we're supposed to do is say no and get rid of it. But if we don't say no, if we pick it up, it says that we, our lust, our choice of of taking that temptation, when we hold on to it instead of dispelling it, lust conceives sin. So what we have to do, in fact, I have this neat little uh, anthem that John Piper wrote. In fact, I keep it taped in the back of my Bible. What he says is, say no within five seconds when sin tempts you. I'm glad John Piper knows that you have five seconds. I mean, he's a genius, right? We have five seconds. So you, you watch the sin for five seconds and, you, uh, and get rid of it. But whatever method you use, verse 12 says, say no to sin. Look at verse 13. That's the third choice. Say yes to God is our first choice. Say no to sin is our second Here here is where sanctification really gets engaged. Verse 13. He says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. The third choice is choose to stop the pattern. See, all of us live by patterns. We just kind of do things in order. I mean, I I find myself, you know, I come in the door and I I put my keys in a certain place and I put my phone in a certain place and I put my shoes in a certain place. I mean, everything is certain places. You have patterns. You know why? Because then you can find it all, you know? And, And that's, we learn that by life. You know what he says? Choose to stop the pattern. Now that I'm redeemed, I can choose to stop the patterns my old sins led me to follow. Like wasting my time, like neglecting God's word, like, like, purposefully hanging around until I get ensnared by the old besetting sin. Choose to stop the pattern. For example, if you struggle with time in the word, you just call out to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I want to stop this pattern that, that a whole night is gone and I find myself still sitting in the easy chair. I've watched what I don't even remember I watched and it's just wasted my time and I still don't have time to read your Bible. And, and I want to stop that pattern. The first choice is saying, God, I want that, and I want to say no to the sin, and I want to break that pattern. So look at the the next part of verse 13, and that's the, the fourth choice. Choose to start a new pattern. But, verse 13, right in the middle, don't present yourselves your your old master. Don't present yourselves that way. Verse 13 continues, but present yourselves to God 
as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What, what's really interesting, as, as you look at your Bibles, each of these are in that imperative form. The reckon in verse 11, the do not let sin in verse 12, the present at the beginning of verse 13, do not present your members is imperative, and the present yourselves to God is imperative. Each of these really is God saying, are you going to say yes to me? Are you going to say no to sin? Are you going to break the pattern? Are you going to start a new pattern? You know, when we were in 12 by 12 uh, study, one of the men told me something really interesting. He says, you know what? This class is a real struggle for me. He says, I haven't had a pattern of reading the Bible in my life. And so he said, this is what I did. He says, I got out my coffee pot. I put in, I ground the coffee at night before I went to bed. I got that out. He said, I got it all ready. He said, I put my notebook. He says, and I put my Bible. And he said, I got it all set. So when I got up in the morning and was stumbling off to get my coffee, I saw my Bible. And I went, ugh. Oh. I got to do that. And he says, after about a week of going, Ugh, I've got to do that, he said, I got to go, ah, I can't wait to do that. Another one told me what he did is he actually set his besetting sin was that he could keyboard and spend time floating around in cyber world all day long, never had time for the Bible. So he put his notebook and Bible on his keyboard. And he said he'd get up in the morning, he'd be stumbling in, ready to start his day, and he'd flip on his machine and he'd go, oh, because he wanted to start a new pattern. But what, look at verse 13. Present yourselves to God. This means asking the Lord to change your appetite. This means asking the Lord to give you the strength to get rid of whatever enslaves you. Choose to start a new pattern. Now, we have three minutes. Did you know, remember I told you all the Bible's connected? Did you know that Jesus asked every believer to once at least every single day of their life as believers to stop and to look up and say, God, I know you're in heaven and I know you're surrounded by holiness and I know that's where I'm going and I know that, that you are my God and my creator and therefore I want you to control my life. I want to say yes to you as my master I want you to start a new pattern in my life. I want you to control what I do. I want you to lead me through life. And I even want you to provide what I need and provide for me this day's daily bread. Do you know what that's called? The Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer says, I need to every day start out by focusing on God. Then I need to ask that God. I need to say yes to him. And I want you to control my life. And your kingdom start coming in my life. And I want your will to become my choices in life. And then I want you to give me what I need. Not what I want, what I need as my daily bread. See, that Lord's Prayer has these very same elements. And it describes a life yielded and turned over to start a new pattern with God. So that's how we're going to end. Let's all stand. And before we go, let's bow before the Lord. Let's pray this prayer. But as we pray it, think about redemption. Think about the purpose that we were redeemed and think of the context that what we're doing is inviting God to control our lives as our new master. And just like Romans 6 says, we're saying, yes, God, control my life. Let's pray that to him this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And Father, that's how we wish to live, inviting you, saying yes to you, asking for a new pattern in our lives. And I pray that we might, by the power of your spirit, for the glory of your name alone, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.